they think we won't survive, like we haven't overcome genocide three times. They try to steal our minds, but ALA and still our rise. We lost the whole world, and yet we're still here. The tip of the pen is the tip of the spear, taking up the fight, a brain against brain. Our battleground change our component the same. Our Iki, they fear our weapons of war, so I'll fight for this island until I'm a corpse. And then when I die, my opuno will fly off my shoulders. They stand, so they reach for new heights. Hey, ho, na o, luna e, pi i ana o, lalo e, hui ana na moku, e ku ana kapaya. Hey, ho, na o, luna e, pi i ana o, lalo, to maka naka hui pu, and hume ye malo, huli kalima i lalo, makau kau ki kipi kalo. Pai pai ho, na pa po haku, inu i ka vai ava ava straight out your apu, and don't forget to keep your aloha kapu, na kane na wahine a me na mahu. Kukia imauna. Aloha kako, my name is Taylor Chang curator of film and performance at the Honolulu Museum of Art and the Doris Duke Theater. We are located in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, being the land of Kanaka Oivi. And I'm very honored to be able to welcome everyone to this virtual space from my home in Kaimuki, Oahu. We're partnering with the Sundance Film Festival 2021 to host this program. And today's program is all about how cinema can be used to protect and honor our relationship to land and to amplify indigenous voices and communities, particularly by way of decolonizing this Western conception of spoken word poetry and by extension, decolonizing cinema. We're incredibly honored to have with us today, indigenous activists, artists, poets, and filmmakers from Hawaii, Turtle Island, and Micronesia, who have all used poetry and cinema to highlight the relationship with land. And as we look at how land informs our cinema and our storytelling, and as we host this virtual program from Hawaii, rooted in Hawaii, we have to ground our program by honoring a sacred place that has played a foundational role in how we understand land-based activism and filmmaking in Hawaii today. Mauna Kea, of course, is the highest summit, tallest mountain, most sacred mauna in our island chain, and is a symbol of Hawaiian resilience for physical, cultural, and political survival, and has inspired a wave of land protectors and a growing Aloha Aina movement across Hawaii and the world. We are very privileged and honored to have two inspirational leaders who have, with exceptional grace and power, fought to protect Mauna Kea for many, many years. Antipua Case is a kumuhula, a teacher of Hawaiian dance and chant, whose voice and leadership have fueled the movement to protect Mauna Kea, bridging solidarity around the world. And we have Nahoku Hanohono Award winner, singer-songwriter, Havane Rios, whose music and voice has opened many, many hearts with their artistry and so inspiring. They have both been featured in the film, Standing Above the Clouds, and we send our deep aloha to them for joining us for our opening remarks and to set the tone and to set the space for this virtual gathering. So mahal nui, Antipua, and Havane for being with us. Thank you so much. Aloha mai kako, o pua keis ko uinoa, o mauna awa kea ku mauna. Mauna kea is my mountain. My name is Pua Keis. I'm born and raised on the slopes of Mauna Kea in a very sacred place called Pu'ukapu. It's nestled in the hillside of Waimea. And I was born and raised as you might say a water protector because my father was in charge of the water for all of Parker Ranch. And every weekend and whenever we could, we rode in the truck up to the mountain looking for water and that is the lifestyle and the life ways that shaped and raised me. So I'm gonna talk about what it takes to become so strong that you can stand as strong as a mountain. And a lot of it has to do with the film that I used to watch when I was a little girl. Once upon a time, there was one film about Hawaii, made in 
1951. And every time that film came on TV, that was the one day that we were allowed to stay home from school. And we, my dad wouldn't go to work that day and we'd all gather on the mattress in the living room and we'd all watch this movie. And this movie had everything in it. And mind you, I was in middle school. This movie had magic. It had lifestyle, it had hula, prayer, chant. And at the very end, it had the ultimate sacrifice, jumping in the volcano to save their people, their land base, their island home. And that film shaped me. That film was called Bird of Paradise. And every time I got into a situation where I had to check myself and say, are you brave enough? Are you strong enough? Would you jump in the volcano like Kalua did? Would you say like her brother did? You are welcome to our islands, but if you hurt us in any way or our island home, we will send you away. Or more than that, you won't ever get away. That particular film followed me and led me through my entire life. When I was with the Winnemum Wintu and I had to jump into a stream of water that came out of Mount Shasta, I stood at the edge and before I jumped in, I said, just be Kalua. And I jumped in exactly the same way Kalua jumped into the volcano. I actually used to practice jumping in from my couch to a mattress in my own Parker Ranch house. Like, okay, how strong do I have to be? Just practice jumping in like Kalua did. When I had to stand on the Mauna, I would say, how did Kalua stand? Now, if you watch that film now, you might laugh at it a little, but I don't. I still watch it. And I watch her as she makes her way up to the crater. And I know she's gonna jump in on a mattress too. But when she looks down at her people and her eyes are filled with tears, I know that she loves them beyond all things and would do whatever it would take to save them. And then she looks back and without hesitation, down she goes. Why I'm bringing that up today is because one, it's my favorite film of all time. The hula is authentic. It was choreographed by the great Iolani Luahine and Queenie Dowsett. Even in 1951, they made sure that it was accurate, that it was truth, that it was the best it could be. And why I'm bringing it up today is because all the way through standing on the Mauna for the past 10 years, what has led us, inspired us, and made us strong enough are those who took the time and knew that we needed to be a presence for the Mauna or we would disappear. And how did we remain a presence and how are we a presence now? It's because of all of you, those of you who document, who capture us, who share the essence of who we are through the visual, through the heartbeat, through the intention, through the commitment, and when you share that, you open the door and you open the hearts, you share it through your film, you share it through the music. And only because you do that, can people like me come in behind you and say, okay, here we are and you've seen who we are, you felt who we are, and this is what we need. And this is what is happening to us. And that's why I'm saying today that film in 1951 shaped me. 
it made me the person that I am today. And you wouldn't have even known that. And you are responsible and you have the privilege of shaping many others who are one day going to share that you are the reason that they stand. You are the reason that they are brave enough. You are the reason that they would sacrifice everything. And you are the reason that they rise. Because Bird of Paradise, a little film made a long time ago, is the reason that I rise. So mahalo nui to all of you. Greetings, everyone. Keep doing what you do so that I can keep doing what I do. Mahalo nui, ya oko. Mahalo nui, kukia imauna. Together we rise. Thank you, mom. Belina mai mekelo hanui akako pauloa. Ova o havane. O mauna awa kia ku umauna. O ko hako hako uka hava ya ku uka puwa meno ipu aina kula ibi. Aloha no kako a pauloa. Aloha. My name is Havane. This is my mom. What case? So honored to come from her and be of her. Um, my rivers are Kohakohau and Waikoloa, and the land that raised me is Kukapuwaimea on the island of Hawaii. I am so grateful to, to be here and grateful for all of you and for all of the ways that we share our art, for all the ways that we continue to tell these stories. I truly believe that our music, our films, our passion for storytelling will gather people won't meet you know for for as long as I have been singing and for as long as I have been chanting I realized that you know somebody a long time ago wrote something to gather us now and this medium of film you know will gather people that will will see that we never stop we never gave up. We never stopped being who we are. We never stopped singing. We never stopped chanting. We never stopped creating. So thank you for gathering those yet to come as we gather now. And I just offer this, this mele from my heart. It's called Imokea. And I was actually not even gonna sing this song until I was listening to my mom talk about um, this, the legacy of inspiration, you know, and this legacy of Ea, because they're, for me, one and the same. And so may we continue to rise in Maokea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
kia i mau na amau rahu aloha aina. Woo! That was just a beautiful start to this beautiful program. <laughs> I um, I'm I'm so excited to now you know introduce to you the amazing poets, activists, and filmmakers who we have for today's panel. And you know, how we're going to do this is we're going to show some sample clips of each of their work and um, the artists will then um, introduce themselves and share a little bit about their work and, and the land bases that are important to them and then inspire their, their, their poetry and their, and their image making. So we're going to first show a clip of This is the Way We Rise, directed by Kiara Lacey, featuring Dr. Jamaica Heoli Melikalani Osorio. We're so proud that this Hawaii film is featured in this year's Sundance Film Festival in the Documentary Shorts program. So please check that out on festival.sundance.org. Um, and then uh, Kiara and Heoli will join us after, after this clip. It's a travesty the way that I grew up being taught about poetry because I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world. It couldn't talk to me as a young queer Hawaiian woman and help me understand like that I was okay. If it doesn't bring a tear to your eye, if it doesn't conjure a memory, if it doesn't give you chicken skin, the poem's useless to me. I think that's part of the reason I, I stopped writing and performing. Not only did it become kind of a chore and even like a pressure to produce for other people, but I felt like I had run out of things to say. We've been here since about 3.30 this morning, locked in, and they're about to dispatch police officers to come forcibly remove us. My name is Kiara Lacey. I am a Kanaka Mauli filmmaker, um, and I have the um, privilege and opportunity to work on a film um, as commissioned by uh, PBS's American Masters and Firelight Media about an artist of color um, on the rise in their career. And that's sort of how This Is The Way We Rise began its life. Um, and I had been tracking uh, Heoli Osorio's work for a while. Um, I have a crush on poets and poetry. I myself am not one, um, but I love the idea of being able to use my art form to support somebody else's art. And so when this uh, opportunity arose, I was like, well, this is a great chance to start a conversation and see if I can um, get to know someone. and. I personally am a verite filmmaker, which means I typically follow life as it happens. And with this film, um, this was something different. You know, I thought I would have the opportunity to kind of sculpt a story and build something very specific around um, Heoli. And um, true, to my, true to my background as a verite filmmaker, um, life made its own decisions. And a couple of, two days before we were supposed to start filming on this project, I got a phone. Uh, I got a phone call or a text message from Heoli saying that she um, had to go to the Mauna to, um, you know, to support its protection. And as a fellow Hawaiian, I understood what that meant. And so, my response was, "Okay, we'll see you there." And I didn't know how or what we were going to do to get there, but um, we found our way there. And I will say, you know, I, I don't know if I would have had the opportunity or you know, figured out a way to be there at those moments right away at the beginning. And my gratitude to this film and this project for giving me an opportunity to not only explore the creative process of another Hawaiian, um, but also see how the protection of our lands also invigorates our creativity and our community as individuals and as a whole. So, um, Hopefully that gives a little bit of the context of, of the work. My, my work as a director tends to focus on what I consider pressure points or places of need for our community. Um, and that's that's been the space that I've kind of occupied to date as a filmmaker. And yeah, that's a little bit about, about the project. Um, Heoli, any thoughts for you about about the film and what it what it means and what we think you know what what your thoughts are. Yeah, 
Um, Aloha mai kako o vau no o Jamaica, he oli mali kalani mozoro, he kupa no ka aino o pa lolo. Um, my name is Jamaica, he oli mali kalani mozoro. Um, I'm from Palolo Valley, but right now I'm I'm in the middle of Oahu, just like 15 minutes away from where Kiara grew up. Um, I'm in Wahiwa. Um, and I'm really, really excited to be here to, to, to talk about this film. And the first thing I want to say is that in the, the sample clip we showed you, there's, there's a young man standing in the center of one of those clips. Um, his name uh, is Mikey Blendon, um, and he was my cousin, and he was a fellow Kia'i, and just a few days ago, he passed away. And so I, I just want, I didn't want to not acknowledge him and his life and all that he has given to our Mauna. Um, and send my aloha to the Glendon Ohana and all the Kia'i who are mourning uh, his loss. Uh, in, in terms of, of the film and, and the creative process, my, my genealogy links me to generations of Kanaka who grew up and struggled and loved and lived in the malu of this mauna that's behind me, in the malu of the mauna that, in the shade and protection of the mauna that the film became to be about, right? That, Kiara and I set out to make a film about the creative process, which for me was really scary because I hadn't felt really inspired or creative in years. Um, and in fact, the only real poem that exists in the film that was written before we were up on the Mauna, which the film also takes part of, it, takes its name from um, this is the way we rise, was actually written for the Mauna. Um, it was written after Ko'okahi and Lanakila asked those of us on Oahu who couldn't come up to the Mauna in 2014 and 2015 to write songs and poems for them. And between that time in 2014, when I wrote um, This is the Way We Rise, about you know you that poem, I hadn't really written a, a real poem until we went to the Mauna. And so I'm, I'm thinking a lot today about, um, you know, Antifua talked about how stories shape us and how they give us courage. And, and Havane talked about the, the legacies of inspiration and the legacies of Ea and how those are, the, those are actually the two same things. And I couldn't agree more. I think um, everything about my life has been shaped by good storytelling and sometimes bad storytelling. And I think of poetry as a part of that work. And when I think, when I sit and reflect about the mo'olalo that Antipua shared with us and I sit and reflect about Mo'olelo that Kiara and I were able to tell through this film um, and the Mo'olelo of, you know, the continued rise of Kanaka Maui in our home. They wonder what kind of stories we want to put to the forefront that are going to shape us and shape our kids and shape our grandkids and shape our community. And, and I wonder if like Kalua and like Antipua, do we have the fortitude and courage to give our lives to telling those stories that will lead us to Ea. Um, so I think of this film as like one other pohaku, one other rock that we throw into, into that basin of Mo'olelo, right? One other attempt at bringing these stories to the front. Um, I've, I was really lucky that I grew up in a family uh, that was invested in Ea Hawaii and, and Hawaiian life and rising and, and sovereignty. But I've only really been a kia'i, especially with Mauna Kea, for a couple of years, you know. So we are also in telling this story. Uh, a really important part of the story is as when it comes to recognizing that genealogy of inspiration and that genealogy of commitment and resistance and folks like Antipua and Havane and their Ohana who have stood for a decade, just against one telescope a decade against one telescope, that kind of fortitude, that kind of, um, that kind of commitment is actually old in our stories. And so I think of, I don't, I don't think a lot about Simono because I'm, I'm not actually a filmmaker, but I think about poetry and Mo'olelo as the most important part is drawing those connections between how we can continue this work. So I think I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm really excited to, to learn more from the other artists who are included on this panel and to talk about how, you know, telling these mo'olalo leads inevitably, right? When we tell a different mo'olalo that inevitably leads to change, that this is an active revolution and an active resistance and resurgence. Um, 
And we do that work by refusing to shut up. Um, and Kiara does that work by refusing to shut up in beautiful ways and like we see in the film. So um, mahalo for having us. Looking forward to the rest of today. Mm, beautifully said, thank you so much. Wow, so yes, um, we're, uh, we're now gonna show a clip from Firecracker Bullets, a film by Chad Charlie. And Chad will join us afterwards uh, to share a little bit about himself and his work. So enjoy a clip from Firecracker Bullets. The one thing that goes through my head every single time I hear firework is November 20th, you know, on the Backwater Bridge. The only image I see in my head is a bridge covered in what, what you would think is like fog. And it's just a cloud of tear gas, people screaming to get air, and all you all you hear is the booms. Why do we why do we blow up fireworks on Fourth of July? Why do we use fireworks to celebrate? I don't know. I sell this stuff and I don't even know. What about this this Thunder Nation? You like it? Yeah. Have you tried it before? Mm -hmm. Pretty dope. Yeah. It looks like this. Boom, boom, boom. See, what's wrong is there's a system. If you're a problem, you go to prison. Fight for the water, you get an eviction. But I only got one question to ask. What do we do when our people are under attack? We stand up and fight back because we are no longer the victims. You can push us back to the res. Take away our rights. It only makes us stronger when we stand up and fight. But at the end of the night, this ain't the land of the free. They got free speech zones, but they ain't made for me. You got a muzzle on my mouth, but you ain't okay with the mask. You asked me to turn around so you could shoot me in the back. Put your hand on your heart. Take a look at that flag. You represent the red, white, and blue. I represent the red, brown, and black. Shoot us down. We stand. Shoot us down. We stand. Shoot us down. We stand. We stand for our people, and we will not be erased. What do you stand for? America. Spelled with three Ks. Oh my God, it's, it's crazy because like, this is my film and every time I watch it, like I give myself goosebumps because it's just, I don't know, like, um, <clears throat> I'll get into that. Okay, so hi, what's up everybody? Um, I'm Chad Charlie. Uh, my traditional name is Uuta and I come from a house at First Nations on the west, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and I am currently residing in traditional territory of the Duwamish and Suquamish people in Seattle, Washington. And um, let's see, I am, I'm, a, I'm a comedian, I'm a poet, and I'm a filmmaker. And fire, I directed, I'm directing Firecracker Bullets. And uh, let's, let's talk about Firecracker Bullets. It's a, uh, it's a personal piece that says you, as you seen, that is me in the, in the sample clip sharing um, my, my poem that I titled America spelled with three Ks. And um, I guess what really inspired, in order for me to like talk about what inspires this film, I have to talk about what inspired the poem because without that poem, like this film wouldn't be happening. Um, what really inspires this poem 
was my own personal experiences, my own experiences in Standing Rock, my own experiences um, as, as an activist, as, as actually a comedian turned activist, that, that basically what, what this story that I wanna tell is, is my own journey from coming, coming from a world of, of, of humor into a world of trauma and then leaving that world of trauma, trying to go back into a world of humor. But in order to do that, I have to, I have to like pinpoint the, the PTSD that I left Standing Rock with. And I feel like this poem was, it's my way of, it's my way of, of, uh, of healing that trauma. It's my way of, like expressing expressing what I've been through, the emotions that I've been through, the 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 emotions that I've felt, the experiences, and you you'll be able to see that within within the film itself. You'll be, you'll be able to hear that in the poem, and I mean like the feeling, you know, the feeling is 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 really expressed within that poem, I guess, and. Um, so firecracker bullets is yeah it's that journey it's that journey of transition from from humor into trauma and then trauma back into back into humor and then um <clears throat> i feel like one of the one of the reasons why it's so important for for me to tell this story is because this story is is relatable to people of color everywhere. This story is relatable, like people are able to feel the emotions that I felt. People are able to, to take this poem and take this film and, and figure out ways to heal on their own as well. Um, I think that's, that's what was really important for me to be able to tell this story. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Feel like there's there's so much that I that I could get into about about this film and, and why it's being made, um, but it's a whole it's a whole discussion. <laughs> and we'll get in, and I'm sure we'll get into it, you know, a little later when um, you know we we're all in conversation with each other. And you know, just because we have a, a little bit more time, um, can you talk a little bit about your film Uuta, the film that you made prior to this, and and yeah. sort of. Yeah, just a little bit about that that film because it's very poetic in its own in its own ways too. Yeah, so Uta is is my first film, and the reason why I wrote that is because it's I mean Uta is my traditional name, and I wanted to basically introduce myself, right, and where this name comes from. So it's about a it's about a whale hunter. Well, it's it's about a young man who is basically trained by his grandmother to become a whale hunter. And technically in, in throughout history, that's not exactly how it works. You don't become a whale hunter by, you know, going like learning at a later time in your, in your life. People are trained throughout their lives to, to take on the roles that they're, that, that they're gonna be given in, in their grown up life. But within this story, I felt, I felt like it was really important for me to, to share like current situations within a historic point of view. Um, and what was important in that story for me was a connection between a young man and his grandmother, uh, a grandmother teaching her grandson how to be a man. And within the communities that I come from, that is a, that's an, that's an important part. You know, we have, we have grandmothers that we've always looked up to. We have we have mothers and aunties and we have big sisters and we have people that, uh, that us as men need to be able to learn from to become men. And that's, I feel like that's why I wrote Uuta in that way. So if you ever, if you ever come across watching Uuta, um, yeah, it's a, it's a story about a young man learning how to be a man from his grandmother. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Chad. Um, so we have we have one more um, amazing guest speaker to introduce, 
uh, to you all. And her name is Carol Ann Carl. We have a clip from her film, Men Matau, and uh, she'll be joining us right after this clip. Uh, Carol Ann is a, is a storyteller and leader in our local Micronesian community in Hawaii. And she's also a biochemistry major. She's just an incredible um, human being. And so I'm really excited to, to introduce her, um, but let's enjoy a film from, uh, a clip from her film. Listen, breathe. Join me on this ocean voyage, navigator. Listen to the rumbling of the great blue, waves glistening under cerulean skies, those beautifully brown eyes sparkling under a yellow dwarf star. Feel the sun's warmth kiss your skin. Feel ocean's cool mist hug you. Paddle paddle limbs breaking the ocean's glass surface let yourself be fully embraced submerged watch as mother stingray glides gracefully by her wings propelling her through saltwater sky dolphins cheerfully playing past you true acrobats without limits aerial flips through ocean and air ocean and air dive dive Muscles propelling you deeper like the sperm whale in search of giant squid. Float with me here. Let the ocean carry you. Suspending you in its wonder as you watch. Brother shark, true protector. Patrolling from reef to open ocean. Keeping balance. As sun sets and moon rises, feel the tides ebb stronger, luminescent life flickering before your very eyes. Creatures painted in colors we could never imagine, painted with all the colors of the ocean. The cool columns welcoming more of our ocean ancestors. Watch the meteor shower that is school of tuna, body silver painted torpedoes, fiery flashes of cobalt, amber, silver fins, creating beautiful chaos. Shooting like poised spear into mass of mangled fish, breaching the flittering surface of frenzied food where frigate birds swarm. Like tuna navigator, we traverse the open ocean traveling in huge families for protection between islands from island to island voyaging across this ocean world the world our world is the ocean survive live thrive listen breathe welcome home navigator the ocean is home Thank you so much, Taylor, for having me um, and everyone else here. Kasalelia, mona iban pachoya na umpukwa wach ichi yanki e sakarata ang kaypani o wow ban kupuran anilap. Wow nuki lapalapakan kalapakan korusia o wow nuki melal irailakan mayang tosaneta sa pan machel to talk and run wach. O pili irailakan may pulikiti sa pan mamail anso pok mamail nyang karonga to talk wach. My name is Carol Ann Carl, and home for me is the beautiful island of Puente in the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, I currently am a Kofa migrant settler here in the Kingdom of Hawaii, living and working in Kalihilihi Olaumiha. I was born in Puente, and um, I like to think that early on, my parents knew they didn't want me to be born a US citizen, so they made sure that they crossed the ocean and returned home. Um, crossing an ocean so that even at birth, I'd know exactly who I was. I've lived back and forth between Hawaii and Puente, but the majority of my life I've lived here in Hawaii, dreaming that one day I'd ultimately return home after my voyaging has ended. There's this beautiful story from the island in Tana in Vanuatu about the tree and the canoe. 
the story speaks of how as ocean people, we are the canoe carved from a tree and meant to cross oceans, building connections and relationships. And as we cross those oceans, being the canoe and just like the canoe, we're also still that tree we were carved from, still rooted in our island homes. And there's this Bonpe in proverb that states, Bonpe sapon karati karata, which means Bonpe is a place for people to voyage to and for people to voyage from. To voyage to and to voyage from the idea is that once you've become rooted in Bonpe, understanding our patapat origin stories, our chiak and sap, the ways we connect to land, the ocean, and our ancestors, then even if you cross an ocean, you become an extension of Bonpe wherever you go. The ocean you cross, whether by canoe or by airplane, becomes not just a bridge, but an extension so that both ocean and island becomes this continuous home and everything becomes full circle. And because the ocean is key to all of this, the ocean becomes home. And that idea of the ocean being home is the seed that sprouted into Men Matau. Um, Men Matau was this collaboration project I did with my friends at Soset Productions. Soset Productions is an up and coming cinematography company run by and for Buen fans. Their storytelling dreams aligned with mine and that was to be like, our dream was that we were the ones to be telling our stories with our own truths. Growing up, it was really rare to find storytelling on written or cinematic platforms because traditionally storytelling is oral, right? And to have it recorded or written down was unthinkable because of course, it's not enough to read the story. You have to live that story to perpetuate it. The orality of our history has always allowed it to breathe as it once did in the past, as it breathes today, and as it continues to breathe into the future. So the question became, how do we perpetuate these stories in these mediums and on these platforms in the most responsible and buen bien way? How do we keep the wow and the menamen in these stories? And our answer was to use the stories and tell those stories through our activism and through our art to create short stories or short films that became dialogue starters. Um, in Point Bay and tradition to tell origin stories is to plant a seed and whether the receivers of that seed choose to cultivate it and nourish it so that it takes root in their consciousness and begins to inform the ways they navigate their world is up to them. Um, a so set, as in Soset Productions, I believe if you look it up somewhere, the stores will tell you that a so set is a master or a lord of the ocean. But English is so ambiguous and the worldview of those who came up with that definition is so absent of the ocean and its capabilities that being a master or a lord of something is the only way they can imagine it. Um, but to be a so set is to be so in tune with the ocean that you are one with it. The ocean can never be mastered, not by humans at all. Um, so a soset is someone who spends so much time in the ocean. They knew they know the moons and the tides, even just what to look at in a frigate bird's flight to show them where those tuna are. And then so bringing back in summary that idea of the ocean is home, why we created Men Matau. Men Matau, the title, my intention with the title was a sort of play on words. Men means to be from or to originate from, and Matau means open ocean. But when you put those two words together to create what everyone hears you say, Men Matau means to be seasick. And this was to intentionally elicit the idea that to be seasick is to be homesick because the ocean is home. Amazing. If I could snap, I would be like snapping. <laughs> I, gosh, thank you all so much. Um, and I'd like to invite all of our panelists sort of, you know, 
virtually back visually onto the screen because uh, we're gonna um, you know have a, an amazing moderated conversation now all together. Um, gosh, thank you all. Um, you know the, the first question that's coming to my mind after just listening to everything that you shared and offered, um, it, you know, is this question about you know how especially for the poets um, here, like how you've, you know, used, um, you know, spoken word poetry, it, you know, and how, how you approach decolonizing the spoken word poetry in your in your work. And then by extension, how that actually influences the filmmaking. Um, so I'm wondering if, um, and I know you all spoke a little bit about that already in your introductions, if you can maybe unpack that a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know if um, Haley, maybe if you want to go first. Okay. Um, I'm gonna think of D. Okay, so I think I think the the form of like the orality of spoken word, um, which Carl Ann was talking really beautifully about in her work, the the orality itself points to the fact that this kind of practice is actually deeply embedded in our own traditional kind of Maoli or UV indigenous practices. So I never much thought of spoken word as a form that needed to be decolonized. And that is not to say that there aren't like people doing spoken word in ways that I think they need to like fix themselves. But I just never th saw myself as I'm doing anything other than sharing more level. And that I was like moving in and out of these spaces that may or may not be indigenous spaces, but my practice didn't shift. The things I wanted to talk about didn't shift. The way that I wanted to talk about them didn't shift. And I, you know, I was really lucky growing up that I was supported by an incredible number of mentors and, and comrades who were happy to let me like go on this ride where I insisted that the audience would come along or they wouldn't and like that was going to be okay. Um, but to get to this idea of like what is, I, I like the question of like how does actually spoken word help us decolonize other parts of our lives. Um, I think the role of, of storytelling of of oral traditions, of mo'olalo, of singing, of chant, of poetry. For me, all of that is both the construction of the story, but also the drawing attention to the story. Um, I think of this work as an opportunity to tell people like, hey, hold on, like pay attention. Something is happening right here that you are a part of, um, that you have the power to, to contribute to, but, or that you are already contributing to in perhaps not the most positive ways, right? And so that's kind of how I, I see my role. I, I talk in the film about the role of the poet being um, the ability to make people feel. Um, because I think in order to get people really engaged in anything, they have to, they have to feel some kind of resonance with what you're talking about. And so specifically as a poet, I try to achieve feeling and resonance of people by just being like really personal and vulnerable and intimate and kind of showing people like, okay, this is who I am in this space. Um, this is my relationship to these things. And maybe you understand this. And maybe if you understand this, like we can meet here in the middle and figure out all this other stuff that's really complicated. Um, Thank you. Gosh, um, Chad, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on, 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 on any of any of the things that was just recently shared. And yeah, <clears throat> so <clears throat> when when I think about spoken word poetry and decolon like decolonization, it's for me it's important to understand um, the history of spoken word poetry, where I like where I believe it comes from spoken word poetry isn't just because we're speaking it out loud there's a history to it which is like throughout history there was a time like me being black and indigenous I like personally I have to be able to remember this where where there was a time when when um black and indigenous people were were um I guess banished or 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 prevented from being able to read and write to express our own art to express our own freedom like we that was taken away from us so when it came to spoken word poetry there's there's um poets throughout history that that used 
um, this art form to, to share their experiences. And the way that they did this was by memorizing their experiences, by memorizing them line for line. And that's why it's so emotional. And that's why it's so personal is because all of these, all of this poem, all of the, the, these poems, all of these lines in this poem is woven within our, like, I mean, right now it's, it's woven in our DNA. You know what I mean? So like, um, it's like when I have, when I have spoken word po poetry, I have to be able to, to look back in history and, and remember why we have this art form. It's important for me to remember why I'm doing this today. So that's why like any of the po any of the poems that I have today is it is extremely personal and it is extremely emotional because those are on our, our own experiences. And the way that I feel like this is decolon decolonizing in itself is that we are unfortunately and fortunately, we are a form of resistance just being here let alone sharing our art form, let alone sharing the poetry, let alone reading and writing. You know what I mean? Like, like that was all taken away from us. And till this day, I mean, um, let's say after, after I came back from, uh, from Standing Rock, I went back home to a house. It, and I remember the community had brought me, like as soon as I got off the boat and got to the island, the community met me at the dock and they pulled me in and they brought me to this, uh, to this uh, secluded um, area. And we went through a whole ceremony and their, their ask of me was basically, we want, we want you to be able to preserve culture. And the, the one way that I know how to do that is through poetry, is through storytelling. And in order for me to successfully do that, I have to always remember my roots. I always, I always have to remember the history of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So just the art form and just the act of doing this is decolonizing in itself. It's, it's, it's a form of resistance. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Caroline, I kind of want to circle back to you because you, you have an a amazing uh, journey as a poet. And I just wanted, if you can share a little bit more about how you, how you started using poetry as a way to, to story tell um, your experience and that of your community. Thank you. Um, I don't think, I still don't refer to myself as a poet. Um, I, I refer to myself as a storyteller um, only because that was my upbringing and my training. And so when I think about decolonization and poetry or storytelling, I think back to my mentors and a lot of, um, all of my mentors were Puentean and the majority of them were conservationists. And so before we'd ever start a project that was always community led, we'd go out into these communities. And when we'd go to sites, I would be told the origin stories of these sites. I'd be told like why this rock is here, what is the meaning of this tree and what's its significance in that history um, so that we can create that resonance, right? And we can create that connection to land and to that community there. And then when we think about conservation solutions, we always ask the chiefs and we'd ask them what um, their solutions always look like in the past and how do we break down all of these imposed systems and we introduce traditional structures. Um, and so for me, decolonization through storytelling um, or my decolonization of my identity was through the storytelling and how we implemented it in conservation. And the poetry only came in when I moved back to Hawaii um, to go to university at UH Maanoa. Um, and there were so many people that I knew that hungered for it um, that I decided to try to use poetry to perpetuate those stories. Can I, I just wanted to respond to something actually that um, Carol, Carol Ann's been talking about, but also that, that you mentioned earlier that really stuck with me when you talked about 
how ambiguous the English language is. Um, and I'm someone who thinks about translation a lot. I, I, I do a lot of my research in Hawaiian language. And so all of my writing is like this weird act of translating what many folks who read my work can't understand. Um, and so thinking about that idea of like the ambiguousness of the English language, but also its, its intention that like it is both ambiguous, but it is also trying to create new associations for us, right? And oftentimes those associations are ones of like dominance, um, only like unequal power structures. And so the stance between the imprecision and the precision of the language that, you know, as poets, all, all three of us are, are people with native languages, whether we speak them or not, right? Languages that are not English, and yet we are creating work in English. And I think that's also a part of this, we're like playing with fire here too. And why I think poetry can be really powerful is that we really get to like talk with language. Um, and we say things in ways where, I'm not too good at explaining this, where like one plus one doesn't equal two. Right, like we create something different than the sum of their parts when we work in verse. And that is a way to me to like mess with the colonizer's language that is both completely ambiguous and intentionally harmful. Um, and I've just been thinking about that a lot, especially with um, what Caroline's been talking about and in watching your clip, um, I thought that worked. That's an amazing point. Um, and it actually makes me think about, you know, the the ambiguity, the ambiguity of images and 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 as an as a filmmaker and Char, I'm gonna I'm gonna point to you because you do this really masterfully um, in your piece. Um, how, you know, not only are you working with the poetry of, of Heoli, but you're also working with the poetry of images and your own experience and and connection uh, with Mama Kea when you were up there and documenting things. Um, can you share a little bit about like how well, I guess how you've worked with poetry in your work in this piece, and this is how this is the way we rise. And then, you know, kind of this ambiguity of images and, and kind of what Heoli was saying and how that factors into your work as well. Um, hopefully I articulated that okay, but yeah. Oh, no, that was great. I will do my best. I think if we, when approaching the film, I felt very strongly that if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna create a film about poetry, the film itself needs to feel like poetry. And I can see that in Carol Ann and Chad's work as well. Um, there is there is a poetics, there are poetics to the visual imagery. And I think um, one of the conversations we had, me and our um, cinematographer Chapin Hall, while we were working on the project was this idea that poetry is non-binary, that you can take two concepts that don't necessarily belong together and they become something more meaningful. There's a gestalt to it. And so, that informs a lot of, I tend to like make one simple visual choice when I'm making work. And so um, using that concept of like combining images and, and what they present to somebody when they're put together informs the one simple choice to use split screen work throughout the project um, and kind of give people a space to kind of connect visual images in a more poetic way and see what they take from it. Um, and so what, what does the juxtaposition of two images um, create and so that was the perspective in you know as for for like a stylistic choice but also to sort of emulate the poetry that we would be hearing and and you know seeing on screen um did I cover it right yeah uh Ch Chad I'm wondering if um because you are both poet and filmmaker um so how, how do you how do you kind of intersect the two in your creative process? Um, <clears throat> let me see. Um, I remember when when I first when I first starting started doing doing poetry for like say YouTube videos. That was like ten years ago. Um, I was I was really really picky on. I wasn't a filmmaker ten years ago. So I, when when I wanted to share poetry to the general public through YouTube. I was very picky on how that was, how I wanted that to look, right? So like, I know personally that that um, my poetry is powerful. I know personally that the words that come out of my mouth and the story that I tell is, is extremely powerful. And I don't want to, 
I don't want to come out with a video that isn't equally as powerful. So there were there were times where 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 I filmed some some poetry and just scrapped it because I knew that the the the, the visuals could not amount to the the poem alone because what I want to do is this poem has to be able to to like like everybody's been saying touch the audiences has to be able to bring out emotion so when it comes to firecracker bullets i feel like this is um the the, the sample clip that y'all watched um i feel like they they go hand in hand because there are very very powerful images from being on the front lines and and the 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 story that i tell in the poem will go hand in hand with the visual because I will be able to give my audiences the experience of being on the front line. When I when I say that 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 I was on a bridge that looked like it could have been, you know, covered in mist, but it was a cloud of tear gas, like I want you to be I want you to be able to see that. Or when 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 my poem suggests that that I I was carrying somebody from the front line and then got shot in the back with with a rubber bullet myself like that's what I say in the in the poem I want the video to be able to to show that as well so I don't want just my words to be powerful I want every part of this film to give that experience uh, for each audience member because that's how that's how you bring out emotion I feel like personally so you bring out emotion people people need need to be able to use all of their senses to to trigger their emotions right so i want i want to trigger those senses and gosh you all spoke really eloquently too in your introductions about how you know the processing of emotions is really part of this healing process both individually for you personally but also and i'm curious about you know how how poetry and film is, is this healing process for a collective as well. I'm wondering if like everyone can maybe share a little bit more about how working with film and by extension working with, with our poetry has been a healing process for you. Um, and, and you know, Caroline, if you wanna, if you wanna maybe go for it first. Okay, I get to cry first. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see healing and my poetry. So having grown up the majority of my life here in Hawaii, um, I'm 25 turning 26 and living back and forth. I've lived in Hawaii collectively for 16 years. Um, so a lot of it has been here. And so when we moved back to Point Bay, like officially when I was a teenager, like I I couldn't say that I was Buen in because I didn't I didn't know Buen I didn't grow up there. I was only there for like Christmases and summers to spend with my grandfather. As much as he and my parents tried to route me to Buen constantly crossing an ocean, it was not clicking for me. Um, so there came a time when my dad was like, all right, I think my daughter needs to start being able to say that she's Men Buen So what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw her into conservation. Um, and so he'd always push me <laughs> with one of his, his boss, um, the man, um, my uncle, Bill Rayner, who passed away. Um, and everywhere we'd go, Bill would always tell me the origin stories, um, whether that was going up to Nenmetal and hearing all the different stories from there, how this beautiful, megalithic structure was created when there was no like construction equipment it's like tons and tons of basalt rocks built on a coral reef so it's literally a floating civilization um, out in the middle of the ocean in Buen Bay. and just teaching me all of these stories from that site to the waterfalls and it wasn't until i finally began to see myself in those rocks and in those structures um, and understanding how beautiful Buen Bay was. Um, that's when I saw that I was beautiful because I was an extension of Buen Bay's beauty. And that's how my healing and my re-seeing myself as a Buen Bay came to be. I love how the rain just got louder as I got deeper and deeper into that story. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> 
people that are nodding in appreciation. One way or the other, the Ina is going to make itself present in this in this Zoom call. <laughs> um, I know if uh, Hilly or Chad, if you want to share a little bit about your experience too, the healing process. <clears throat> um, let me see this this yeah this this journey has like just just creating this film. Um, starting from from the poem in itself was has been a healing process for me because that's like that's I guess why I, I I created this poem was to be able to express myself to be able to express express all of the the anger all of the the hurt all of the pain that's within me um to be able to let it out and I remember I remember there was a time when when um, I held it all in and I felt like all of this energy within me was just bottling up and it made it really hard for me to to live my life and like like I, I, I quit comedy I, I felt like everything that was happening in the world um, just angered me to the point where where I wasn't myself around my family and and I had to like correct myself around my daughter because I didn't want my daughter to see me angry the very you know the very little time that I do get to spend with my daughter I don't want her to see me in that energy so I felt like in order for me to to grow as my own person I needed to be able to to let out everything that I was bottling up and this the this this poetry is is what i used to be able to get it out and it didn't matter to me whether or not um people heard this poetry it didn't matter to me whether or not this was going to be a film this i didn't plan on this film being made i planned on writing like like creating this poem and and healing myself and it had nothing to do with anybody else and the only the only reason why that that <clears throat> this film is being made is because this story and this poem is relatable to to people all around the world experiencing the same anger experiencing the same pain and the same trauma and in order for in order for i guess in order for this to be a successful film i i need to be able to to let this resonate with other people so it can you know bring out that emotion and, and heal them as well. And that's just the hopes. I mean, I, I can't, can't promise that I'm, that I'm healing anybody. Um, it's just me sharing my own, my own process of how I do it. Um, see, you know, I don't think explicitly about healing a lot, to be honest. Um, and I know a lot of people do, and there are people who are like actual healers in this world and they give their lives to healing the land, to healing themselves, to healing the people around them. Um, I think a lot about intimacy. I think a lot about connection or the word we use, healing, right? We'd be stuck to something to be intimate or something. I think a lot about how disconnection happens and how even when it seems um, to happen by chance that it's almost always intentional um, and that one of the most powerful processes of uh, colonialism and occupation and militarism and fascism all these isms racism is disconnection and it's an intentional disentanglement of our intimacy with each other um, and from a Hawaiian perspective from a Kanaka Maoli perspective I think in particular about the ways that uh, how people benefit from my disconnection to the people around me, to my family, to my land, and to myself. And so when I think about poetry, I think about an opportunity to articulate and rebuild connection. I think about the way that, that my people know my ancestors, when they wrote a song or a poem or a story for someone that it didn't belong to them anymore that it belonged to the person that they wrote it for. And so that is a process of making connection, right? So the, the idea 
of we have this particular idea of the the speaker and the audience in kind of at least in like western literature right i won't speak to cinema because i've never studied cinema but from like a western literary perspective right there's a really clear articulation of who the author is and who the audience is and the author is the owner of the process and the product and and my people and my history teach me that like that ownership is is actually a lot more fickle than we than we assume it to be. And in fact, anytime I create something, because you are what has inspired me, that creation is yours. And that the only thing that is mine is actually the process, um, is having the opportunity to kind of go on that journey uh, to give you something meaningful and in that giving, creating connection. And so I think about poetry as this like small way that we can all do that. And as, as something that I've been really lucky to be able to do that again and again. And and I think about the poetry and the imagery we created on the Mauna together in the last few years. Um, I think about the power that we create, that we remember within each other when we build connection between each other and our mind. I think about the power of truly intuitively and intimately knowing yourself. I think about the power of falling in love with yourself and with a landscape and feeling under the responsibility and privilege to protect the people around you and that landscape. Um, and I think that that's really important. And I also think that one of the reasons I don't talk or think about healing a lot is because oftentimes, and, and I, I don't believe that this was your question, Taylor, but oftentimes in the world, um, when folks come to Indigenous people, they ask us, like, how can we heal from these injustices? And how can we move forward and build unity? And and all of that's like a load of crap. Like I'm not doing this healing to heal my relationship with my oppressors. Like that's another process that that's not this. This is about me and the people that I love and the people who I've been um, detached from and remembering and, and mending those relationships so that we can move forward and we can decide how and if we want to approach our relations with those who continue to harm us. And in that way, this work is also like calling attention to the wound rather than uh, putting a band-aid on the wound so that everyone can be made comfortable again. So I'm just sorry, but I know we have a lot of fun. Those are my thoughts on healing and poetry. If I could, if I could add, on, add on to that, I think um, you had mentioned this idea of intellectual property and Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian intellectual property. And this is something I think a lot about, which is and how I kind of focus, how I create work as well. It's like, I think in Western context, the ownership or the IP of what you create is the director or like, you know, the company. And I think recognizing that when we create work, it's about who it's created for, right? Who it's, who it, who it's about. And I think it fits more in line with the Polynesian worldview about the kako, you know, about the community. And there is a generosity to this idea that I create something for someone else. And it belong when I create it for them, it belongs to them. Um, and I think when we approach things with that generosity, it changes the outcome of the work. It changes how we our process to the work. You know, it's not like, it's not about limiting, it's about expanding. And I think if we talk about healing, right? Maybe it, maybe it's not even necessarily about healing. Maybe maybe the healing comes from a shift in perspective, and if we talk about what's going to be the solution or part of the solutions for getting our communities and our world towards better in the future, it's about recognizing that yes, each individual is important, but truly our our collective survival is bent on each individual recognizing their contribution to a community and how we as, as these little pieces of the community um, are responsible for making sure that we can all survive and thrive. And the work that all of you create helps to remind us all of that, right? Like our emotions, checking our emotions and you know, being present with ourselves and our own healing. You know, and, and what we wanna say is as individuals and members of a community. So yeah. Always towards better, my friends, mahalo. Brilliantly said, all of you. 
Um, and I know we're, we're like nearing kind of that tail end of our time. And I, I'm wondering, just like inspired by just Manal that you all just shared, um, whether maybe we can, um, you know, before our, our, our kind of closing offerings, um, uh, if everyone can share a little bit about, um, yeah, who, who your work is is for and, and what connections you want, you hope to bridge with your work. Um, Yeah, Caroline, I'll, I'll go to you first. Um, for me, my work is for all of the youth, not just in Buen Bay, but across Micronesia, who grow up as canoes detached from their trees and who don't actually understand the trees that they come from. Um, it's, it's to plant that seed um, and and seed that sovereignty so that they can they can they can get rid of that hunger that they're feeling for identity and for place and for home. Ah, oh, beautiful, Chad. You want to go next? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so. The work that I create, I feel like I've always had, I've always had the same goals throughout throughout my entire life. And that was like just based upon where I come from. And me myself, I can like I can say that I am just I am just a, merely a man of my community. I'm a, I'm a member of my community and everything that I do is not only for me, but it's for the benefit of my community. And mm -hmm. And there's like words that like I kind of like remind myself every day is that that regardless of the circumstances that I've been in, the experiences that I've been through, my current circumstance does not dictate or determine the impact that I have on within my community. Um, regardless of, of what's happening within my life or what's happening within the rest of the world that does not change the goal or the 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 love that I have for my community so every yeah everything that I do is 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 for you know the the homelands for the people for the community I was probably 13 the first time I saw the Ku'e petitions and I saw the collection of, of fierce Aloha Aina activists who gave everything they could to fight the illegal overthrow and annexation of our kingdom. Um, I was 13, like 13 or 14 years old when I saw my ancestors' names on that petition and I saw how how big these petitions are when they're bound together, that nearly every single living Hawaiian at that time signed them. And I remember weeping in a classroom surrounded by my peers. And I didn't even care that I was weeping surrounded by other teenagers, which was like the most mortifying thing you could do at 13 years old. Um, but I was weeping because, because they stood up and they fought and it was proof. It was evidence that they loved this place and that they loved each other and that they loved me. A few years ago, I, I read a, a newspaper article written in 1861, 62, where Joseph Kanepu, he talks about how we need to preserve our stories because the people of the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and the 1990s want this stuff. And I was born in 1990. When I read those words, I left because I knew that he loved me. So I write because I love Joseph Kanepu and I love Eliza Kamakuiva Ole Osorio and I love Daisy Kelly Ava and I love Lili Kalani, our queen. I write because I love them and because they showed me what it looked like to love our descendants. Um, and I, I write about the things that I write because I spent my life questioning I didn't know if my grandparents loved the queen because they couldn't tell the stories that we tell today in the way that we tell them, that they were 
there was a silence enforced amongst them. And so when I write, I think about that entire genealogy and the, the, the privilege of being a part of that genealogy. And then I think about my kids who don't exist yet and my grandkids who don't exist yet and yet are already here. And I think about how I don't want them to just have to look back to 1898 to know that their people loved this land and loved them. I want them to see me and say, my mother loves me. My grandmother loves me. And that this love for me is the same thing as this love for this Mauna or for this Taino. Um, that's why I write. Um, I make films because uh, I want to see the strongest version of my community as possible. Um, and if I see a point in our place in our community where we need help, we need vision, we need, we need us to be looking, um, that's my goal. I, I wanna be able to make sure that we can all see where we can pitch in, where we can help, who needs help, what are those, again, those pressure points that we as Hawaiians can contribute to. Because if we, sometimes you don't know, and if you don't know, you can't help. But if I can, if I can, to use an overused phrase, if I can shed the light on a spot, right? If we know, if we can share where to look, then maybe we can help fix things. Um, and it's always with that lens that, okay, how do we, how do we change this narrative that's been shared about us? How do we reclaim, reclaim it with our own voices? And also use, you know, use our storytelling to create strength in our people. You know, when we when we define who we are, we have power. Um, and I want to support the power of my people. And it's intrinsic. I am I am Hawaiian, so I, I am naturally connected to my other Hawaiians. You know, and um, wherever they are in this world, Caroline, as you've said, right? Some of us. Some of us, I, I didn't even know this word growing up, diaspora, right? What is that? I don't know. Like that, is that a Western word? It's, it's something we're definitely experiencing, right? But um, how do we make sure that we as a community, no matter where we are in this world, still feel that sense of home? Because particularly as Hawaiians, and I'm sure others can uh, understand this as well, that there's something unique about, about being an indigenous person where it doesn't matter where you're standing in this world, you always have your compass towards your home. Um, and so I, you know, I create for my people and I follow that compass to where I come from and I share gratitude to all of you for talking today about, about your stories and your work and you know, gratitude to all the people that came before us that made these opportunities for us possible. This was such the most, um you know, speaking of grounding and and inspirations that can help navigate us forward, um, you all are it. <laughs> I just want to. I just can't extend enough gratitude to each of you for your like truly uh, generous sharing, um, and and just for all the work that you're doing and you're putting out there. Um, to strengthen each other and, and our people in, in all the different ways that, that we exist in this world. Um, whew, I, I know we wanted to, you know, share, you know, this close, I, I, this was actually quite like this perfect kind of closing, um, but yeah, and um, Mahal Nui to each of you and um, let's keep navigating forward together and creating collective poetry together like this session was in many, many ways. Um, cannot thank you enough. Um, if anyone wants to add any any final thoughts, please feel free to, but we're, um, thank you. Thank you to everyone who uh, has been tuning in and who has uh, been with us in this virtual space together. Um, and uh, please, please support these artists and these filmmakers and these poets work in whatever way that you can. Um, and and uh, we will put some links in at the end of this uh, for everyone to go to. And um, uh, thank you all. <laughs>